Well, good morning again, and welcome home. I don't remember a whole lot about my youngest years. I've got lips. I, I don't know why. I just do. Maybe I'm just weird, or maybe that's normal. I don't know. And I'm not sure at what age and exactly where this particular vacation Bible school scene in my mind was. I was probably staying with an aunt or something and going, I, I don't know. But I remember the songs. And I remember one particular song that stuck with me. Even though I didn't really know the words until years later, because you just kind of sing along and, you know, that was back before you could just Google everything, because I'm a Gen Xer, so. Anyway, the song goes like this. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery, I may never zoom or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Okay, I know, my singing, there's a reason I don't leave worship. We sang it along with all the, the other ones, you know, the B-I-B-L-E, all those cool songs. But that's the one that ironically connects to the miracle I want to talk about today. Let us pray. Daddy God, Abba, Creator, Mother, Universe, however we see you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the word that became flesh. Thank you that it's more than just a book, that, that we can interpret things and that we can apply things to our lives and that that's what brings the meaning. Lord, I, I pray that you, through the Holy Spirit, release discernment within each and every one of us and provide those nuggets of wisdom that apply to our lives through this message and beyond. Thank you for just the honor of of being able to deliver this message and help my heart to remain obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we've got the, now that you've got that song, I know at least one of you remembered it at least, and maybe some of you others, there's someone in the, oh, I've got someone in the balcony remembered, it's my back here, cool. So, uh, so thank you for that affirmation because <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't just me. But among all the healings and the feedings and even that whole water to wine thing in the Gospels, one of Christ's miracles, I believe, sometimes is overlooked. Because it was just kind of one of those like that. It happened in, the, in, the, in a split, maybe not a split second, but in, in a few seconds. And it was just, Christ just did it moved on because it needed to happen. And it's basically his final public miracle and it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 22. This is during his arrest. While he was still speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, is it with a kiss that you are betraying the Son of Man? When those who are around him saw what was coming, they asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. In the Gospel of John, we learn the name of the attacker, Peter, Simon Peter, that, that dude. And we learn, learn the name of the slave who was struck and then healed, Malchus. And to set the stage, let's back up a little bit in the scriptures, but still in the same chapter of Luke. This is the same person who drew his sword. Just a few hours, maybe several hours before. In Luke 22, starting with verse 31, uh, this is kind of at the Last Supper. Jesus is, is revealing a prophecy, essentially to Peter, who's also called Simon. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. 
And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you have denied me, until you have denied three times that you even know me. Many of us have heard this. We know about, about what happened. But I, it, I wanted to bring that up to remind us of that foreshadow. If you, if it, because it helps set that scene. Remember, Simon or Peter has been told that he will deny even knowing Jesus, his leader, his mentor, his oh captain, my captain. He's going to deny him three times. And Peter's like, uh, uh-uh, uh, I am not going to do that. And and I don't doubt that that was in his head. I don't think it's much of a stretch to say that that was in his head right then. That he's like, no. See, Peter was anxious then to prove his loyalty, to essentially prove Jesus wrong, which scripturally kind of is what Peter did. I mean, at one point in the Gospels, when Jesus is trying to prepare them, he's saying, hey, you know, there's going to be a time when, when I'm turned over to the authorities and I'm killed, but I'll be back because that's where the, that's the whole purpose is that I'll be back. I'll conquer them. Everything will be okay. Peter, as he does, was like, no, I won't let that happen. And Jesus calls him Satan. Pretty harsh. He says, get behind me, Satan. Basically, don't, don't try to contradict what God is saying. I'm trying to prepare your hearts, and you're over here acting all macho like you're going to defend me. And it's kind of that same concept on the night of the arrest. Peter was anxious to prove his loyalty. And given... What he knew, and what kind of we do even nowadays, that's one way to prove your loyalty. That's one of the threads I want to chase today. Jesus had warned Peter of what would happen, as, but there was more to it. He warned him so that Peter wouldn't give up after the fact. It was basically a given. This is going to happen. But look again at verse 32. When Jesus is telling him, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. He was telling him, whatever happens, you know, I know this is going to happen, but I'm not condemning you for it, Peter. When you're, when you're back, I'll need you. You know, you need to strengthen your brothers. And we know further on that is what happened. But Peter latches on to that first part. His ego just can't handle being told that he's going to be somewhat, somehow imperfect and not the best of the best of the apostles, you know, that kind of thing. He vows never to disavow Jesus, which misses the point entirely. Quick lesson. How often have we been guilty of only partially listening or missing the main point whenever God is talking to us, whenever... The Spirit is talking to us. How many times do we latch on what, what we think? And we do this with other people, too. We don't listen. And what does that lead to? But now back to the larger spool. That's one thread. Hang on to it. Back to the larger spool. Peter attempts to prove his loyalty by violence. And Jesus, as he has throughout his ministry provides another larger lesson. Look again in Luke 22. Now this time it's starting in verse 50. Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, no more of this. Basically, this has gone on a long enough. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Set aside the Simon Peter stuff for now and let's look at another layer of this event. See, Jesus had been teaching about fulfillment of law and getting people to view even the laws differently. Back in the, like the Sermon on the Mount, all of that, that launched out the three-year ministry, he'd been saying, you know, basically, you've heard it said this. Yes, that's in the scrolls, but I tell you, here's another way to look at it. And he's doing the same thing. Instead of, you've heard it said, but I tell you, He's saying, you've seen it modeled for generations that this is how you show faith. 
through violence. But I show you that's not what God wants. See, they'd seen it modeled that there are classes of people. Slaves were more like property than people. So who knows if anyone would have cared or noticed, you know, maybe they would have just gone on, and maybe Peter would have had to pay a fine, maybe he would have been convicted and killed, I don't know, but the idea that they pointed out that this was a servant, a slave, makes it in the culture a less than. And yet Jesus, in the midst of being arrested, after hours of praying, parts of the scriptures say he had been praying so hard that water and blood flowed. Not because he was cut, just blood just seeped out of his pores. That's some hardcore prayer. So he's in the midst of all this. Knows about what's, I'm sure, I, I don't think he knew specifically there'll be this many lashes and this will hurt here and you'll get, the, not necessarily that. But he knew basically he was going to die and it was going to be brutal. It wasn't just like, well, I like to say you just wake up dead one day. It wasn't one of those calm things. In the midst of all that, in the midst of being with this chaos of a throng of high-strung holy rollers and government officials coming together, church and state, unifying, Jesus stops to care for a less than person, a those people person. Through actions, Christ again points out You've seen it modeled that people are either us or them. But I show you, God covers all people. In doing so, he also basically, through his actions, rebukes Mr. Loyalty, Simon Peter, and rebukes the notion carried for generations of violence in the name of God. It's too bad that wasn't picked up on more. Christ's actions say, you've seen it modeled to declare war and attack people as a way to show faithfulness. But I show you to love and protect and even heal those you proclaim as enemies. Jesus turns on its ear, pun intended, the entire concept of trying to be God's bodyguard or something. I mean, one of our songs we sing about the power of God, that, that God's power overcomes death. And yet we somehow feel like we are called to be God's bodyguard. See, Jesus doesn't just talk. He demonstrates that God doesn't need a defender, a hero, so to speak. God doesn't need an army of soldiers. God is big enough to take care of themselves. What God needs, what God wants from us, is an army of servants. And yet, how many of us, going back to Peter's thread, feel the need to prove ourselves, and to feel the need to prove it to God, and feel that need to do it by dominating someone else? by picking the right side, especially now with what's going on in Gaza, what's going on here, what's going on everywhere. You know, I, I preached a few weeks ago about the more things change, the more they stay the same. But there are lessons we can take from Christ's life that can directly apply Christ came to fulfill our needs. Yes. Christ came to fulfill our need for blood. The blood of our enemies. Our, he came to fulfill our need. And by fulfill, I mean, you know, when you've eaten and you're full, you don't need it anymore. Maybe there was a time when we needed that concept. But once Christ came, whether... 
and that's debatable. I, you know, I have my own views on, on even that. But let's say there was a time when it was needed. When Christ came, especially further on, when he says, it is finished. That should have ended our need for blood. Period. That should have ended our need for us versus them. If it hadn't already. And yet, we still only halfway listen, like Peter did. And then we miss the actual message and go off on some half-baked notion that fulfills the ego. And I'm speaking to myself. Some concept of righteousness that I feel like, see, I stood up for God. Now, I'm not saying don't have boundaries. I'm not saying don't stand up for what you believe. Don't stand for justice, all that. That's not what I'm saying. But don't, please, don't fall for that trap of declaring someone an enemy in the name of God. And especially for conducting violence in the name of God. Or supporting some form of genocide or war or any of that in the name of God. Do those things happen? Does genocide happen? Yes. Does war happen? Yes. But let's take the name of God out of our mouths when we do that. That's using the Lord's name in vain. More than any kind of cursing, curse words, or whatever. Adult language that you all know I'm capable of. Christ shows us another way. Jesus reminds us we are called to listen and follow God, not to dictate who else or how else anyone else conducts their journeys. Jesus didn't say, I heal you, but stop working for Caiaphas, the high priest. That was the, the servant of the high priest, or the slave of the high priest. Jesus didn't even say, you're a priest. You shouldn't have a slave. You're supposed to set this better example. You know, he didn't, he just healed the guy. In the midst of everything else. So if you want to sing that song about being in the Lord's army, put away the guns, put away the national red, white, and blue flags, or whatever color of whatever nation they are, and get out the foot washing towels. That's the Lord's army. Serve. Take care of people. Heal when you can. Love as much as you can. Yes, have boundaries. But whenever you catch yourself, like with Peter, instead of saying, no, that won't happen, I would never do that, acknowledge that we're all capable of it. I mean, I know I do it. As much as I try not to, I still do it. But also know the lesson there is when Jesus said, once you've got that out of your system, and you come back, strengthen my people. Don't just hide in shame and say, well, God can't work through me now. Don't, don't, don't. That's just another ego thing. It is. But be open to the lessons. Be open to do the best you can. And when you know better, do better. And even when you don't meet your own expectations, don't put that on God either. Take a breath. Try again. Get out a bowl of water. Wash those feet. Or if you listened to Tim's message last week, pour a little sweet tea and sit across from the table with someone. Let us pray.